This is uh, the Board of Ed meeting for April 1st, 2020. Uh, we can start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I have a little flag here that you can see. Oh, nice. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I pledge allegiance to the flag <laughs> of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, there, <clears throat> there was a few comments from last uh, from the public for the last meeting. Uh, there were just basically two from uh, Michelle DeMauro, who volunteered to do anything she can to help, and Heidi Pizzo, who basically thanked us all for all the work that we're doing. Um, so I can have a motion to approve the agenda. <laughs> So moved. So moved. For Victor. Second. Second. Yeah, you, you have to say your name Andrew. so you can get it in there. Victor, I so moved. And Andrew will second. Andrew is second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody. Thank you. The next uh, board meeting will probably be on April 22nd and following on the April 29th. And that we'll we'll talk about those as we get into the budget schedule, but there won't be one on April six. That was the meeting for uh, the general public, for the hearing on the budget. So the next meeting will be April twenty second, and again, and the follow up meeting on April twenty ninth, in which we will wrap up the budget at that point. Uh, you, we could have a board meeting on the on April six if the board would like to. That's Monday. If anybody need, if we need to, it's scheduled. But if anybody thinks we need a meeting after on April sixth, after this meeting, we can still hold it, uh, and we'll get a notice out on Friday. But we'll, let's decide at the end of the meeting if we should have one on the sixth. So the next uh, item is the school climate <coughs> update. Uh, so and Kath. Okay, for the school closure update uh, for item A, uh, the health director and, co and governor calls, we have those um, every week. And much of the information that we hear on the governor's calls are things that you know in the public. Uh, we did also have a call with the commissioner of education. Um, it, again, as you know from the governor, the um, the, at this point, there have been 19 executive orders since March 12th, and last night there was a new executive order, and when we get to that point in the agenda, I'll give you an update on that, but, um, you know, the, I guess the primary focus from the governor was that we expect to see, um, or it is predicted that we'll see an apex in terms of the cases in the next two weeks. The importance of that for us is that the Commissioner of Education anticipates that by around April 10th, that they'll be able to make some decision regarding the extension of the school closure. I don't anticipate that that extension will go from April 20th to May something. I, it will be that, you know, it's either, <laughs> after April 20th, we're coming back, highly unlikely, um, or uh, we'll be out for the remainder of the school year. One of the comments that the commissioner has been making publicly more often is that they, when pressed by superintendents to, you know, do, do you think you're gonna let us know? What he's saying is he wants to be sure that when they make the decision, which I, I imagine will be the decision to go and uh, to remain closed to the end of the year is that they want to have the information that they know school districts are looking for. And this is a national conversation um, in particular in terms of things such as um, the uh, uh, graduation requirements. So, so that has been a, a 
big topic of conversation recently with the Commissioner of Education um, and always stressing first that uh, safety and security is what's critically important and that they will just monitor the data on the virus and the recommended responses to that in the near future. Our conversation with the health director on Tuesday morning, which um, although it is the Southington Plainville Middlefield Health District, our health director has invited Laura Francis to be a part of that, which she was on Tuesday morning. A big topic of conversation among the uh, police officers, town manager, first selectmen, um, emergency responders, and, and superintendents on that call had to do with the um, kind of congregating in uh, public places, playgrounds, uh, walking trails, uh, uh, tracks, etc. cetera. Ed and Laura and I had um, our meeting this our standing meeting this morning at 8 a.m. and we collectively agreed that given the nature of the next two weeks that as of Friday we will um, we will close temporarily for now uh, they will close Allenbrook Park Peckham Park we will put signs on our school playgrounds and uh, our our basketball courts. So we will leave the, the walking track at, at Coggenchag open. That is a place that's used and that appears to, uh, people appear to really be following social distancing there. Um, our basketball courts, although with the rain and a little bit of chillier weather, we haven't seen a lot of active use out there, but in the warmer weather, we have seen quite a few people congregating there. So though we hate to do that, we believe that it's the right thing to do right now. And uh, we felt really good about the fact that the three of us were working together to make that decision on behalf of our school community and the communities of Durham and Middlefield. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, the legislative changes and updates, as I said, there have been 19 executive orders since March 12th. Um, and I went to bed last night and <laughs> woke up and there was a new executive order. And it's very possible that there might be one uh, happening right now. Um, and this was actually quite an important one. Um, last night, the, 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 which is Executive Order 7R that was put into place, and that is the continuation of funding for boards of education, continuation of payment of public school staff, um, and preservation of student transportation services and special education providers. Um, in a nutshell, and I, I can share, I actually have all um, 19 executive orders on a document that I'll share with the board, and you can go to the full executive order for more information. The continuation of funding for boards of education means that we will continue to get our excess cost funding um, and ECS funding as, as was planned. Um, the continuation of payment of public school staff at last week's meeting, I, I told you that District 13, along with um, the majority of districts in Connecticut, had already made the, um, the commitment to remain, to continue to pay all staff members through the end of the school year. Uh, at, at the time, it was the choice of individual school districts. Many school, very big school districts had laid off hourly employees and have now been told that um, those employees, all employees need to be on the payroll. Uh, preservation of student transportation services. We had put transportation down because um, you know, that was an item that Kim had talked about last time, so she'll go into that a little with a little bit more depth. It's similar in many respects to the preservation of special education services, which involves our uh, school districts being responsible for, um, oh, I know why you can't see me because I don't have my laptop open, guys. Jeez. So the, um, continuation 
of payment for our our outplaced students um, in so that uh, the staff members at the the outplacements will continue to receive their salary and their benefits. Um, and we will also be in the same situation with accepting tuition from our from our tuition playing districts for our services that are rendered at MTA. Uh, one of the um, considerations too is really looking at what percentage of services we're we're delivering to to students and then charging districts that percentage. But some of the fine tuned language on that really has to do with um, covering salary and benefits. Um, so those are the, the high level of the, the most recent and most important executive orders. I did ask Mary Ellen Manning to join us uh, this evening. She has done an exceptional job in our um, HR department in terms of organizing any type of legislative changes that impact our employees, including FMLA, extended sick leave, um, and, and issues that are related to COVID. And she's created a document that she updates in real time so that staff can access that. And um, I just asked her to come and give you, give everyone a, a just a high level overview of that because it's really critically important. Uh, I think that the board understands some of this. I'm all set, Mary Ellen. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. In regards to um, making sure that the organizational development HR office and certainly the business office continue to um, support our employees, we made sure right from the get-go, really the week of the 17th when things were starting to pop, if you will, to make sure that we stayed in consistent communication with our employees, but also began to work in real time to stay updated with Shipman and Goodwin and and um, Bloom Shapiro in regards to what they were offering for guidance in these areas. Um, and so we've been able to provide guidance to our employees, um, as Kathy said so well, in real time. You know, it, these are um, documents and information we're getting and are updating on a daily basis. So just in the next few minutes, I'll give you a high level overview of what, the, of what President Trump signed um, in mid-March or towards the end of March, which was the Families First Corona Response Act. And really there are two components to this act um, that really have two separate legs. One is to provide care for family members with COVID-19, which expands um, FMLA. And the second is um, providing 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave for employees to recover from and or to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. So those are really what um, we wanted to make sure employees were aware of that um, really went live um, officially tomorrow, but we needed to make sure we shared with our employees the deadline was today. We did that um, uh, really probably towards the middle of last week that we started to provide them with some details as well as um, you know kind of FAQs as they relate to this area. So I just want to make sure that you understand that FMLA is, this, this new law is really best described as FMLA plus in the sense that, um, you know, our employees are already covered through Family Medical Leave Act, but due to COVID-19, it is much more comprehensive. So a few things to highlight is that anybody who's employed with us for 30 days or more will now be covered. So it, it's safe to say that all of our employees will be covered with the new um, FMLA plus um, law and moving forward the coverage of such law. Um, also in regards to our paid leave, our families and our, um, uh, excuse me, our, our employees have already their own sick leave or um, bank of sick leave. This is on top of, so to give you an example, if we have a full-time employee, they would be able to have 80 hours or the equivalent of two weeks paid leave on top of whatever, whatever they may already have in their sick, sick bank. So this provides um, additional coverage for, um, for our employees. Also with that includes intermittent FMLA, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, that provides kind of a staggered leave for people 
this will be good both short term from um, teleworking and also long term if we were to go in through um, the fall of next year. Again, these both of these uh, acts are um, active, if you will, through um, close to the holidays of 2020. So they're um, active laws through 20, um, excuse me, through December of 2020. So this will provide some variability for our staff, both while they're teleworking and also as we go into the fall of next year. So I think that's really, you know, I don't, I don't want to give you too much more in regards to that. I just want to make sure before I wrap up that you understand that the, the paid sick leave kind of falls into uh, certain categories as well as the, um, the, the additional sick leave bank. So in other words, if somebody is um, self-quarantined, if they have symptoms of COVID-19, if they're caring for somebody who's quarantined or has COVID-19, um, and also if they, in regards to the FMLA leave, if they are unable to um, do their job or their telework assignment because of taking care of a child, um, because they're home with their child, because of the, the homeschooling component, these are all areas that fall under both um, the FMLA plus as well as the, the expanded sick leave. It's important to note at this time, nobody um, in our, um, our school district and in any of our classifications have requested any of this leave at this point. Um, I also want to assure, you know, assure the board also that at this point, all of our uh, employees also have been um, given assignments um, and are currently working. Um, remotely in various capacities, all classifications, whether they're union or um, non-union at this point. Um, again, a yeoman's job, as Kathy says, in regards to working collaboratively, making sure all of these employees are um, currently working remotely in a variety of capacities. So at this point, again, just to, to recap, um, nobody has requested at this time for either one of these new opportunities, if you will, to be described, which is the FMLA plus or the um, additional sick leave provided by um, the government due to COVID-19. Any questions in regards to that? It was a very quick overview, as you know. I certainly have um, documents that I can share, the overview document that was provided to our employees that I'm happy to share with the board um, at any time. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yes, Bob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. It's been absolutely invaluable to have someone who could put this together and that we have someone on staff for um, our employees to reach out to. It's a, a very uncertain time for people um, and Mary Ellen certainly has been a wonderful resource for people. Um, I asked Kim to talk about this uh, transportation and li literally last night, um, this uh, with the executive order, there's some considerations for us because last week we had talked about the potential impact this would have on, on the budgeting strategy that, that we suggested. So I asked her to talk, talk about this and um, also, uh, she can talk a little bit about what the, the impact will be on, um, on our bottom line in terms of our transportation, our transportation costs. Hi, good evening. This is Kim Nobing, Director of Finance. Um, and essentially, in a nutshell, what Dr. Serino had said about the outplaced tuition applies to the transportation. Uh, essentially, the executive order says that boards of education shall, um, and they use the word shall, negotiate amendments to transportation contracts for providers uh, in an effort for them to continue compensation for their health insurance and health insurance to their active employees. Um, the executive order also requires that they provide uh, adequate documentation and attest to the fact that they're charging only actual and reasonable costs. Um, they will, um, in CASBO, which is my a business manager group, we've had numerous discussions around this, which I'm sure you can imagine. And um, we're, we're thinking, you know, um, Clearly, there's got to be a formula uh, to determine this. The monthly invoicing does not break down staff versus 
fixed costs and whatnot. So we are requesting that from our vendors across districts across Connecticut to see what the actual breakdown is to pay for health insurance and uh, staffing. And the, the um, executive order is essentially asking the uh, transportation providers to avoid any unnecessary costs. Um, an early discussion of an amount could be a 20% discount. Um, that we would have to pay 80% of our remaining transportation. We have about $400,000 remaining in our transportation contract. Uh, so a 20% discount would be $80,000 that, that we would be able to hold back. Um, similarly to the um, transportation, as Dr. Serino said, is the uh, public and approved private special ed providers which will also have to provide uh, attestation that they are uh, only charging reasonable and customary um, pay hourly rates that were in a force before uh, the executive order and nothing can be increased. Um, and so it certainly does not contribute to their profit. Um, and that's, that's it on the transportation. Thanks, Kim. Um, we had, again, last week when we made the, the uh, agenda, we had the executive order wasn't in place indicating that all, all of our staff needed to be paid. Um, staff has been great to work with. We created MOUs um, with our six bargaining units, which include our teacher support staff, custodians, administrators, nurses, um, food staff, food service, and then just agreements with our non-union employees. Um, as you know, our teachers uh, and are up and running with distance learning. Our, many of our support staff are in place and working to support students and to support, um, and to support our teachers in terms of the modification of student work for those students in special education. Uh, over the course of the next two weeks, we're looking really carefully um, at, at all of our employees. We've kind of created a grid of who falls within either a particular bargaining unit or a classification, what skills they have, what needs we have, and, and how those two things can be joined in terms of um, the, you know, the situation we're in with distance learning. We have talked just very recently about the ways in which all staff can be used to enhance the learning for, for our students who, who really need an, an extra degree of support, including perhaps being able to flex the hours of some of our support staff so that we've, we've kind of targeted that nine to two learning time, but we do have students for whom having someone who is checking in maybe at three o'clock, four o'clock, maybe even close to five o'clock or somebody who might be checking in with high school students a little bit later in the evening. We've also looked at the um, arranging for our support staff to have kind of enhanced professional development so that they have another skill set for working with students. Um, in terms of our custodians, we really, you know, with direction from the health director, decided to, to kind of uh, uh, flatten our, our buildings in terms of leaving them open or leaving them closed to staff for about two weeks. Sue and Jimmy identified a number of tasks that can be accomplished that are things that we've, in many respects, have put off. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of things that our custodians um, will have the opportunity to do it with an extended closing, clean the auditorium, power wash the bleachers and clean under them, clean and paint dugouts, clean out storage areas under low, lower levels, clean out storage areas and mechanical rooms at uh, Cog and Chug and Strong, clean garages, clean, clean and organize custodial areas. This of course, in addition to our, our primary uh, closure task, which includes um, cleaning and sanitizing all classrooms and offices at Lyman Memorial and Brewster um, because we've done work in all in the other buildings. Um, in terms of our nurses, just, you know, our, our um, head 
nurse, Pam Bransifort, has been the person who has been primarily engaged almost on a daily basis as plan a part of our planning and response team and uh, has been an invaluable resource to me. Additionally, she's worked with uh, parents who have questions as well as people who have needed to come to school to pick up their medication, their students' medication from all of our, our school settings. Of course, you know uh, the work that our administrators have been doing, which is just kind of a continuation uh, of, their, of their work when we're uh, fully uh, functioning. And our, our food service, a, a, smaller a smaller union, we've kind of relied on Mark Basil, uh, our head of food service, as well as a couple of our food service, service staff at the high school who have worked to do our grab and go lunch program, which is now doing lunches on Mondays and Thursdays, um, giving meals that span the entire week. What we're going to begin to implement with our food service, however, is a rotation of that of the staff through the, the Monday uh, Monday, Thursday food distribution. And, and just, you know, I'll, I'll have long-term data for the board as we get going. This week, we served 36 meals. Uh, oh, also, I just wanted to, to let you know, and I, I'm sorry if I mentioned this, Last week, uh, Pam Branza for our, our nurse also compiled a, um, a donation to the Durham and Middlefield first responders, including face masks, um, uh, the um, Crosstech Isolator Plus surgical face masks, and 95 respirator masks, um, Super Sani clothes, goggles, and gloves. Um, and I have to say that everyone in our staff is eager to help and support and do whatever it takes every day and are, are grateful that uh, we have been able to, uh, you know, maintain their, their salary and their benefits. <clears throat> Uh, our distance learning is is up and running, and what I would suggest is that you know perhaps by the end of end of April or beginning of May, I think it might be a good time for us to actually have a student achievement meeting after we have several weeks of stu of distance learning under our belts for for the student achievement team really to understand what's happening, what it looks like. By that point, we will have received feedback from students and parents that, that we'll be able to share. Uh, what I want you to know after, if you can believe it, just day three of distance learning, we, we have gotten feedback that we value, and, but in today's letter to parents, what we ask them to do is obviously give, give us critical feedback to, their, to the teacher if their child is struggling with the content or if, if they're struggling with access, but we are creating a feedback protocol so that we can gather that feedback and then really uh, reference it to the practices that that we're using um, so so that we can really um, continue to refine and improve what it is we're doing. Corey has done an outstanding job and I would uh, actually I can direct you to this document I think I've shared it with you but I'll share it with you again the student expectations and parent support document is really an outstanding comprehensive and easy to understand document of what's going on across all areas of, um, of distance learning. I will say uh, one of the most common questions we've gotten right now is if and when we're going to move away from um, asynchronistic um, connection with students, which means that students, uh, teachers, record a lesson, record a message, but it's not, it's not live, it's not happening in real time. And what many districts, and we made the decision for a number of reasons. There's, there's several considerations that we have, but I will say to you that the primary one has to do with um, skill, 
of the teacher and the ability to roll out in a way that we're doing things correctly and we're doing them once. This morning, Corey and I were involved in a conference call with our consortium superintendents and um, curriculum directors. And uh, for those people who got started a little bit before us, they have said that they waited a few weeks before rolling out um, for instance, uh, uh, like a Google Hangout where a teacher would be with an entire classroom. I'm not, it, I, I'm not committing at this point that that's the direction that we're going, but it's obviously something that we're looking at seriously, but one thing at a time. We are doing that for students who receive special education services so that they're working one-on-one -on -one with their teacher or service provider like a school psychologist or a speech pathologist. I reached out to Jen today just to see kind of the size of the group, the, the largest size of a group that a special education has worked teacher has worked with at this point, and it's about uh, five to eight students. So um, I think that that's probably a question that board, me board members could get in terms of, you know, my kid wants to see his or her teacher, they want to see their peers, and they want to interact. Our priority, do it safely, maintain all student data privacy um, considerations, and, and make sure that we're doing it correctly and we're not overloading our teachers who many of whom are working 12 and 15 hour days so um uh, and in special education extraordinarily proud of what's happening there each uh, for each student our special education staff has developed a, a student learning plan specific to distance learning and the guidance. There is a lot of guidance from the State Department um, with the kind of the overarching expectation to meet the, the needs of the students as identified in the IEP to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and I think I'd uh, let you know in a board update that the SBAC and the SATs have been canceled and AP tests at this time uh, will be administered to students at home online. Uh, the next question, do we, or we had put this again on there before uh, I worked with Laura and, and we are using the uh, Town of Durham Zoom account. Uh, and I thought that that was a great suggestion. I believe it was from Bob Yamartino that we partner with Durham and Middlefield, which as you know, Ed and Laura and I meet on a regular basis. And through the conversation with um, Laura, her tech person, um, Alicia Willa, and our Superman, Ken Petrasco, we were able to get this up and running. So I'd like to thank them and also just acknowledge the positive and collaborative relationship we have. Jamie uh, reached out to me yesterday because there have been some concerns about Zoom specific to FERPA as well as um, security. And, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this security because it's been all over the news, but in particular, in terms of student data privacy and FERPA, I wanted to make sure that I reached out to uh, Shipman and Goodwin uh, to make sure that, that we were covered. And there have been concerns about this. People have been working directly with Zoom as it pertains to school districts. And uh, our response from uh, Shipman was use of Zoom with board members does not implicate the student data privacy laws or FERPA as long as no personally identifiable student information is being disclosed, which may occur in an expulsion hearing, for example. In general, a Zoom board meeting would be fine from a legal perspective. The board should be cognizant, however, of the alleged security issues with Zoom. Uh, and then the next uh, part of item F had to do with community participation. And I wanted to turn that over to Bob Yamartino and the rest of the board members. But I know, Bob, that you had some specific ideas about how we could encourage community participation. 
yeah, after the last meeting, um, it became apparent that we're going to need to determine uh, a method to allow the public to provide input on the budget and a method for which we, we can um, handle it. So one suggestion I had made um, to Bob more after the meeting was that uh, the method we could use would probably be best done with an online form that the person could come in and complete with their name, their phone number, their email address, and their street address. And then they could list, we will have specific categories um, by budget item, you know, the major item, uh, line items in our budget, such as salary, um, uh, maintenance, that kind of stuff. And then they can, you know, click, okay, this is salary related. They can then say specifically what it's about and then give um, a, dis a, a description of what their question or suggestion is. Um, this will allow us then to very easily compile all of the public input. Now, in terms of timing, one of the things um, the executive orders from the governor have given um, broad privileges to the um, towns and to the Board of Education for adoption of the budget, as, as you're all aware. Um, the timing, I think Bob mentioned at the last meeting, was that the towns were um, looking for a June 2nd adoption of the town budgets and the school board would need to be uh, June 1st. So the thought from Bob and I as we discussed it is that um, we would then develop a calendar going back in which we would have the first step would we would present a draft budget to the community, allow a week or so for public comment through the method I described. Um, we would also want to take that same information about how they could respond, and we can send that out in a mailer to each house with the paper version of the form that they can complete if they want. Um, however, that will require someone to manually enter. So the preferred method will be for them to go online. Mm -hmm. So we'd, we'd first issue a draft. We'll wait. Uh, we'll allow for a week of public comment. Then we will um, have a discussion on the board where we'll adopt what we believe to be the final budget. And then, um, again, submit for, for comment. And then we will uh, come back and, and ratify it. So basically, we'd be looking at getting a draft budget out sometime in the first week or so of May um, to have the first draft. Around the 15th, possibly have a, uh, a final draft. And then at the end of May, 1st of June, formally adopt it because it'll just be a vote of um, the members on the Board of Education to formally adopt the budget. So that's kind of my thoughts on an approach that we might take. Bob and I talked about that um, last week. And uh, you know, if anybody has any other thoughts, maybe we could um, hear them now, or we can prepare a draft of uh, the questionnaire and send that out. To the board members. Yeah, I, I I sent one out. I was telling Bob at the start of the meeting. I sent one out this week, a, a rough draft, so people could take a look at it prior to this meeting. But apparently, it didn't go out of my mailbox. So we'll we'll get that available and we'll send it along so that folks can take a look at it. Um, we basically have the month of April to really formalize it, but it it. It would be a more systematic approach than, you know, fielding a bunch of emails from people and then that would require someone to interpret, you know, uh, well, this person is talking about this specific line item or that and then we would have to categorize it. This way, we're asking the public to categorize it. They have to put their words, you know, put it into the category it belongs in. So then all we need to do is it's in an Excel spreadsheet. We can sort it by category print a single report, we all have it to look at for consideration going forward. We also talked about putting in front of that, <clears throat> part of that form is the process that we're going through because the general public will not have heard that we're not gonna go through a referendum or a vote or anything like that. So we give everybody an opportunity to understand why this is happening in this manner. 
Yeah, that would be the focal point of the mailer that goes out to every house. Thanks, Bob, for bringing that. I, I would suggest that there be some place that allows for comments that are not about specific line items. So more general. Comment. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we would definitely have a, 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 an other category in all of these. <laughs> so people can say other. They can say, oh, it has to do with salary, but it's, it's an other. When we go to the subcategories, it could be an other in the subcategory, or it could just be an other in the main category. You know, mm -hmm. hey, in general, flash the budget, you know, that you'll get those comments. So, yeah. I think if we, uh, you know, if the timeline that the commissioner is talking about in terms of definitive information on school closure extending uh, uh, through June by April 10th, that gives uh, Kim and I the, um, really, because we've got kind of scenario A, um, there are a few scenarios but that would will give us a more definitive um, timeline to do the projections in terms of the kind of revenue that would need to be expended because of the closure and and where we will be under expended so that in the um, our desire to use the budgeting strategy of that net under expended to to offset next year's budget, we'll have a better idea of really how much money that is. And I would, and it would be, it would be great if we have that information by April 10th, but we're prepared for that. So I think we'll be able to move rather quickly. Kath, when did, <clears throat> when did you say you wanted to have a, um student achievement meeting to talk about the uh, after the uh, April break? You know, what I'd like to do is reach out to Corey about that. You know, I think um, what I was saying was end of April or beginning of May. Um, I think that that gives, you know, that just gives us some time to, to really be able to talk about uh, um, what's most important, which is implementation and what's happening for student learning. And I think that, you know, kind of she's she's the expert on that. And so I would defer to her. She and I have our weekly meeting tomorrow and, and we can talk about that and she can reach out to the student achievement team uh, committee about that. Good. Well, Bob, uh, we'll try to get that form. Maybe we can get it to uh, Megan uh, and see if she can't put it in a form that we can all get out and see. Yeah, if you could send that to me too, Bob, uh, that'd be fantastic. Megan, and I could take some time um, probably on Friday morning to have a look at that. Okay, that would be fine. One question I have, um, from an IT perspective, I, uh, I'm envisioning that this is an online form that people can pull, put uh, in. And the way I had structured it is there's an input form, and uh, I, I did it in Excel, which has an input form, so everyone can complete the input form, but then it automatically transfers it to a single data sheet. I'm not sure if, um, if we have that capability in the software that the school has, so if we don't, we can talk about how best to do that. Um, Ken's on the line. I don't know, Ken, if, if you feel like you can comment on that. If not, we can talk about it at another time. Let's talk about it at another time. <laughs> Lost Ken. Okay. Bob, are we ready to move to the next um, yeah. item? The budget discussion. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for all that uh, work on that. I know that you summarized about 100 hours of conversation <laughs> and communications into 15 minutes. So thank you very much. I'm just trying to tell you guys the good parts, but there's, there's certainly as, as plenty more. This is a, uh, it is a dynamic process for sure. 
Um, so as we move to talking uh, about the budget, and, and Kim's going to talk about uh, really some of the really specific areas that that we're talking about, and, and also broadly talking about some scenarios in terms of what it means for us to get to a zero if, if uh, you know, that's what we're working for for next year. So uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, that was just last week, that we are, you know, a couple of things we're looking at. The first is where are we right now? Are there things that need attention that we hadn't budgeted for, but we actually could allocate funds towards either because let's say for instance, it's but purchase service, uh, purchase services, and we we're going to work with a specialist for a particular area. But now we've decided, hey, we have some kids that we would like the specialist to work with directly, and so we're going to within that area, we're just going to have that person rather than work with staff, maybe do some direct work with with students. Kind of to Andrew's point of last meeting. Um, and then there may be some areas which right now we, we're not thinking of that where we would ask the board to approve a, a transfer of funds from one area to, to the next. But really what we're trying to do is project forward where we will be under expended and, and, and what impact that would have in next year's budget. The other piece of this process in, in building next year's budget is to look at the, the budget that I've already proposed to you. And on Friday, we have a full administrative team for us to take a critical eye on um, what was proposed. Are there any changes? Are there some things that we didn't put in there that we might want to? Are there some, because of that, something that we might take out? Are there any changes that we can make to the proposed budget so that we're potentially reducing the, you know, two point, I can't even remember what the increase is, Kim, what is it? We were at a 2.29. 2.29% uh, increase. So, uh, so that's kind of what's what's happening in in real time right now. So I think Friday, I don't want to make decisions on behalf of my team. I think this is work that Kim and I clearly could do on our own, but this has been a collaborative process up to this point, and we want to make sure that we're continuing to make the best decisions possible for students. Um, given the circumstance and then just to, to continue our long-term vision. We don't want to, we, we don't want to step off the path there, but I'd like to turn it over to Kim now to, to talk about some specific areas and scenarios associated with specific dollar amounts. Okay. So this is Kim Newbing, Director of Finance speaking. Um, over the last week, uh, Dr. Serena and I have been reviewing the year-to-date expenditures um, with how they compare in regards to budget. Um, we're looking at accounts that could be potentially underexpended due to the COVID-19. Uh, many line items are not affected by the shutdown by nature of their expenditure. So fixed items such as insurance, debt service, software support, those things are gonna continue regardless. Um, unless, you know, uh, touched by executive order, which I, I doubt any of that will be. Um, and then there are those line items that will be addressed by executive order, which I discussed earlier, uh, specific to what I'm looking at would be salaries, uh, transportation, and outplacement services. Outplacement services. Um, for planning purposes, until the time at which we can determine what the best formula is for transportation and outplacements, is it, is it a 20%? Uh, discount is it does is it higher than that so until we really know that I've not included those uh, line items as part of my estimated year-end surplus um, so certainly it's good to have a little buffer built in there anyways um, and you know if we're looking at a 20% discount it's in, in the neighborhood of an 80,000 to just keep that in mind um, there's also some areas that still need to be further examined to determine the status of are they viable during a shutdown can we can we actually provide that service uh, during a shutdown. Uh, can we use it during distance learning? Um, 
Can we do OT and PT? Can we do psych services? Can we do speech services? So that's something that we're going to further vet at the administrative meeting on Friday, um, see if they're practical, um, and to see maybe we need to repurpose them into something that's a, a priority. Um, then there's areas that will experience increases, uh, as Dr. Serino said, uh, legal. Um, we've been reaching out to our legal, uh, to our lawyers. Uh, uh, for guidance throughout this, um, and you know that comes at a cost. Um, and storage of um, prepaid fuel. We have prepaid our fuel to take advantage of the discount, um, and now we have to pay for storage of that if we can't, uh, you know, get that uh, pumped out to another location. Um, so there's just things like that 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 are occurring, arising just because of the closure. Um, still, there's other areas that I'm able to report with a comfort level, uh, assuming the school does not resume for this year. So I have made my assumption based on that. Um, I still, you know, we need to wait and hear from the governor. So if that changes, of course, all this changes. Uh, but this was sort of a, you know, a, a starting point to determine, you know, if we don't go back to school, you know, these are the, the areas that I'm comfortable with. Um, it's a fluid number. It's gonna change daily. It's gonna change based on executive orders. It's gonna change on uh, priorities. Uh, it's gonna change on uh, discoveries that through the distance learning platform, we determine there are resources that we need that we don't have budgeted for currently. Um, so that's something that is really, it's my best educated guess at this point. Um, these areas uh, that I can really kind of realistically count on having some sort of a surplus uh, is in the area of, of, of uh, salaries, uh, mainly due to substitutes. Uh, with the executive order, we're paying our uh, staff members. So the, we have encumbered it. Um, you know, we sometimes there would be times throughout the year where maybe we would have a teacher go out on leave and we'd have a substitute come in or whatever the case may be, uh, staff uh, transition um, turnover. Uh, we won't have that necessarily this year, um, maybe some leaves, but so we really are gonna be paying what we've budgeted for. And just reminding you, we budgeted at 98%. The surplus or underexpended amount of salaries, most of it comes from substitutes. We're not gonna have to do, sub, you know, um, use the, hopefully use the amount of substitutes that we have used in the past. With custodians um, being we're back at work and you know um, having some time to do some projects that maybe we would have had to pay over time or bring in additional help to do, um, we're thinking that we may have a little bit of a savings there. Unfortunately, athletics. Um, athletics stipends, uh, coach stipends, officials, game workers, athletic transportation, um, a, a, a surplus of there of over $100,000. Um, our benefits for our health insurance, again, um, not going to see a big surplus there because we're, you know, looking at, you know, staying the same status quo, paying benefits, um, snow removal. Hopefully we're not going to have any more snow. Uh, so we, we do have a, a surplus in snow removal. We have a surplus in purchase services of about $70,000. Uh, not a lot, and those are kind of things that I took the liberty of saying. I'm not quite sure that we'll be able to um, appropriately or realistically uh, get this service um, being on distance learning. But again, that's, um, I was a little on the conservative side with that and, you know, need to vet that out with the administrators uh, on Friday. Um, supplies, electricity, fuel are obvious we're not in school or maybe our lights are staying um, off based on our schedule. Uh, our fuel, you know, we're, we're heating at a uh, lower temperature. Um, so we're, we're having a savings there. Um, we have some small savings in transportation because we do have to um, uh, provide transportation for the kids going to magnet school and that is outside of our DACO contract. So um, th that's really just a per diem rate. So we may see a little bit of savings there that, that probably doesn't fall under the executive order. We have uh, $25,000 unexpended in travel and 15 in dues and membership. So I kind of didn't give you all the numbers because, um, but they total up to $655,000. Um, so that represents a surplus that we could potentially have. Now, in addition to that, we also have to look at the revenue side. Um, we know that there are areas that we're not going to be receiving the amount of revenue that we had budgeted for. Um, we're not going to receive all our preschool tuition, um, our pay to participate fees, um, buildings and grounds rental, 
Um, excess cost grant could potentially go down um, if we're not paying our full tuition um, and transportation. If that gets discounted, that could affect our SS excess cost grant. MTA, if we're not charging 100% of the tuition because we cannot uh, perform 100% of the uh, requirements of the contract, that will reduce our revenue. Um, parking passes. Um, and then another thing to note, and I put it here as a negative revenue uh, as exposed to an expenditure, but our food service department, wondering, doing a great job, operating great, no revenue coming in. Um, we are allowed to uh, submit our claims, they're called, to the NSLP um, each month, and we do get reimbursed for a certain percentage on the free and reduced meals and also on the, the full pay meals, uh, but those don't cover the costs. Um, the things like the, you know, the lunchtime, the hot lunch, the um, extras or a la carte items, not happening, and, and that really was a lot of um, what helped to fund the program. So I'm anticipating, and again, I, I caution to give a number. Um, Mark and I are working on, he's doing a great job uh, giving me the information I need. I don't know, if we look at this at the end of the year with a $20,000 deficit, I'm not sure that could be a little high. Um, we're gonna bet the numbers a little bit better, but I'm adhering around in my Casbro group too that they're looking at 30 and higher. Um, so I just wanted to make that a point. Now that's a, a separate program whereby the expenses are paid from the revenue brought in. Um, but if we don't have the revenue to pay the expenditures, we're gonna need to look to the board to either or, you know, help pay those expenditures or even to just give the, to pay those services. Um, so that gives us a net total of $528,000. So that's a healthy um, surplus to be able to apply. Um, has been lower than previous years, but you have to keep in mind that we, we did some significant budget strategy last year with the 98% salaries to sort of not have that. And things can still change. We are still only in April 1st. So we could have a teacher go on leave. We could have something um, that will drive our costs down. Um, but we could have the reverse. We could have with people uh, maybe losing health insurance through their spouse um, would qualify as a, a qualifying event and then may ask to join our health insurance. Um, so it's sort of, like I said, a really a fluid number day to day. Um, so with that 528,000, there is a um, maybe a happy medium at which we can apply a portion of that toward balancing the 2021 budget, but then also leaving sort of this in here for the unexpected, the unknown. If we don't spend that unexpected unknown, it just goes into the following year. So it's not lost. Um, and so it just wouldn't help us with 2021. It'll help us with 21-22, which is the, the flow that RSD 13 has always followed um, to, to apply it once it's audited to the follow year out. Because these numbers will be, if we're going to use them in our budget scenario, the surplus, the anticipated surplus, unaudited numbers. So could change. Um, and so with that, I've created various scenarios for the board to consider, uh, depending on the direction of the anticipated surplus. Some of these uh, scenarios go from um, scenario one, allocating the total estimated surplus to the fund balance. So just being aggressive and taking the whole, the whole 528, I don't recommend it. I'm just showing it as a, um, you know, as a, a scenario for the board to, to consider. Um, a second one would be, happy medium, taking a portion of that service, the surplus to put to fund balance, and then a portion to allow to us then apply to the 21-22, so we're not so aggressive. That, that's the kind, that's the one that, that is, uh, I think is the answer. Um, and then the last one is a combination of allocating the portion of the estimated surplus uh, along with cuts to expenditure. So if we're looking to get to a zero, um, then we would allocate part of the fund balance, uh, estimated surplus to fund balance, but then we'd have to look at the expenditures and, and reduce those to see how we can get to that zero. Um, whatever you don't from the, it's a $785,000 uh, cut to get to zero from the uh, superintendent proposed budget, less the field house um, that's been removed. Um, so that's a big cut. So if we were to take you know, the 500, we're still looking at $285,000 that we have to cut out of there. Um, so with that said, that's what the 
practice is going to be on Friday is to kind of look and see what things in the 2021 budget that now we may have different priorities. Um, we're going to be looking at the budget proposals that were included in there. Um, as Dr. Serino said, maybe we're going to be pulling some of those back out. Maybe we wait a year for certain uh, budget proposals. So we're going to be looking at that. I want to keep you to keep in mind um, for the 2021 budget, we did budget with a vacancy factor of 5%, which is large. Um, before COVID-19, we wanted to, as our budget strategy, use uh, the fund balance that we had um, in an effort to reduce taxes out of taxpayers' uh, uh, funds, out of their, their wallets. Um, so that, that's a, sort of an aggressive strategy. So now that we have this new player, um, the COVID-19, you know, certainly um, to have, which I said, I don't, I think my, pre my preference is to only take part of the anticipated surplus because then I want to be able to make sure we have enough in fund balance should we go over this vacancy factor. Um, and then, um, yeah, so then, you know, on Friday, we'll, we'll know better uh, what we can look at, maybe certain things we can defer. Um, hey, I think maybe we're even learning some different things in this being out of school um, that we might say, well, this was a better way to do it than through a purchase service. Um, so we might have a little bit more insight than we did a month or so ago. Um, so I think that that'll be an important thing. Um, I did provide some numbers, um, but again, those are just really different scenarios that I came up with. I don't really have much teeth at this point, but I was just looking at all kind of our different options. Are there any questions? I'll ask a hard one. I don't want to be a, the killjoy in this, but um, have you thought about the fact that until there's a vaccine or we have all gotten COVID and either survived or not, there may be the need for social distancing. Vaccines may be a year and a half out. It's not impossible that next school year will start in the same state that we're ending this year. Have you thought about what the budget could possibly look like? We're budgeting for a situation which is wildly unknown, but I wondered if you have thought at all about what, what the boundaries would look like if we went into to continue distance learning in the fall, what would, how would that affect the, the budget that we would need to have in place in the fall? Yes, we, we actually have, um, and, and, and I won't say that it's been a, at this point, Victor, a robust conversation, uh, but it certainly is something that I have contemplated based on, on what I, understand and because that's my job is to think of every potentiality and consider that it's something Kim and I have begun to talk about so right now our exercise is the um, if we were to begin in the fall in the way that we began last fall what would the budget look like um, and then, yes, we need to talk about if distance learning continued in the fall, would it be likely that distance learning would, would expand for an entire year? I think that's unlikely, but I'm, you know, I'm not the DPH uh, specialist here. Um, but so, so, yes, we have thought about that and what the budget implication would be if, let's say, we weren't back to school until December, for instance. Um, but that's, uh, it, it, it is a scenario that we have considered, but not one that we have put pencil to paper at, on at this point. Um, this is Kim speaking, but you have to, um, you know, just just know that the biggest portion of our budget are our salaries, our benefits, and our transportation. So those are still in play um, through executive order. Uh, the budgets, you know, that could there be areas that we would repurpose or be able to reduce or perhaps increase? 
Um, but the biggest drivers um, are what I just mentioned, and then the fixed costs, the property insurance and, and things like that. So um, I don't know that it would be a, a big, big difference. Okay, so it's not, it's not that we would suddenly face a completely different situation. No. Uh, highly, highly unlikely. Would it be different? Yeah, um, but, but nothing drastically different. Good. Yeah. Also, you. Victor, Victor, I, I think you'd also want to consider that we're going to be making our best guess in the June time frame for what next year will look like. And I don't think we would be, I think we would be doing a grave disservice if we budgeted any kind of an assumption of a reduction in next year's cost due to distance learning. Because in all likelihood, we will be back in school. That's the scenario that's going to be the most expensive, and we need to budget for that. You know, I'm. I'm just. I just think. I only mentioned that because it seemed to me we ought to know what the boundaries are, and if what we're clear is that the boundaries, that the boundary of being in a distance learning situation is not bigger costs than the ones that we have for going back to school. I see what you're saying. Yes. Okay. I, I, yeah. I guess Dr. Serino might be able to speak to that better, but from what I can see from the finance side, no. I mean, our biggest yeah. drivers are people and, and health insurance. So that would remain the same. And, and I, th same. I think as we're d talking about uh, our next board meetings and this process and, and having this be a process of integrity where we don't abandon the um, what went into creating the proposed budget in the first place. And that's kind of where we bookmarked when we went sideways, so to speak, or we were, our attention was diverted to this. We were just at that, you know, we were just at the good part of the budget process of, of really having more of that dialogue. And I think it's important that the board doesn't abandon that and that we, we really have those discussions uh, about about some of those uh, those proposed items or any area of the budget. So I think we have I think we've done a good job of anything that was brought up in a in a board meeting. We talked about we talked about class size. We, you know we talked about you know why does it look like the tech budget is so high at the high school? You know just simply because we've shifted a staff member. A number of things. Um, any of the the budget questions that that board members had submitted in the shared document, we you know I I believe all of those were addressed. But I do think we need to spend some time talking about the talking about the proposed budget. And I think if the board were able to convene on April sixth, and we could dedicate time on Monday night to that discussion, I think it would be very helpful. I also will have on Friday have met with the administrative team to to have some possible adjustments that uh, that we would make. Now it's never ever our our goal is never to hit a number, especially if the number is zero. Our goal is to meet the strategic uh, goals that we have for the district to look at our long term planning. And what happens in situations like this simply, you know, sometimes we hit a point in the budget season where the board says like, uh, yeah, we feel like you need to come in lower. When we go back, what we do is we kind of ask ourselves um, basically two questions. Is there another means by which we can achieve this goal? And I'm just going to say, for example, and I really hope that enrichment teacher stays in the budget, what were the goals that were identified in the proposal um, that included an enrichment teacher? Are there other means for us to get there? And then the other is, is there a different timeline that, that we could follow? So, you know, I, I share that with you just um, probably to reiterate something that you already know, it would, it is never my intention to go back and say, well, we're just going to abandon this because we've got to, we've got to hit that zero. We understand it's, um, 
this is unprecedented and and historic, but we're still going to apply our our best thinking to the process. So, so Kathy, you, you want to try to keep, meet on Monday night? Well, I would leave that to the the board to uh, to discuss to see whether or not that works for all of you. You think you'd have enough? information to make any changes in that? I think we could, I think what I'd like to do, we have to kind of run some simultaneous scenarios. I would say to the board, you know, use that budget worksheet and, and if you could tomorrow, if there was anything that you're saying like, oh, I still have a question about that, or this is so important to me, I hope that it stays in the budget. Um, always wondered about this. If, if I have that information before I go into Friday's meeting, um, and although the administrative team is pretty good at having a, a once a month full day meeting in person, it is a hard to do, it's a hard thing to do on Zoom. So we are gonna have probably a two hour power meeting on this. So you're, if you have some input that for our consideration before that, that'd be really helpful. Can, can I, ju I just want to get an understanding of like what the process behind the re kind of examination of this budget is going to be. Um, I, I guess I'm just, uh, not, not, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit annoyed by the fact that um, the, that the messaging that came out from, came out from not from the board itself, it came out from an external meeting was that we needed to make changes to the budget and it needed to be lower and it wasn't it didn't originate or come from the board itself uh, in a board meeting i'm not even sure if everybody agrees on that we need to make cuts or changes to our bu existing budget we haven't really discussed that like it's this has become a process where it was suggested by town leaders that we hit a particular number. Um, and then all of a sudden there has been significant movement towards providing proposals and budget recommendations that could get us close to that number. Um, I mean, I think, and this again goes back to the issue around, um, you know, choosing priorities and everything else. I, I would hate to see that the budget is skimmed in different areas to meet meet that. I think that's what we've done in the past. It seems to be that we've now kind of <laughs> transitioned to where we had, you know, previously been as far as the way the budgeting process was being developed, like being developed. Um, I, I guess I just wish that it would have sh the the discussion would have shifted and would have been we would have had an initial discussion to say oh, do you all think in light of everything else that we need to look and start and make changes to the budget to you know, appropriately recognize the fact that people are gonna be struggling that the, of the economics of the situation? That, that's just not how it came out. It was, oh, we had this discussion. It was you know, with the town leaders, they said 0%. Now we're looking into budget cuts. Um, and I just don't think it's the, our, the way that we're supposed to handle uh, board issues is supposed to be at the board level during board meetings. And this seems to be, this was a, an extraneous meeting that I think of, of a huge issue um, that I don't think we've had the appropriate level of conversation even at the board level um, to kind of to really kind of reflect on whether we should be even going down the path of looking for cuts. I, I, I mean, I think it's a reasonable question to ask. And I think we should say yes, no, that's feel, you know, we feel like that that's the pathway we should be looking for at this point. Well, that meeting came up as part of a selectman's meeting with us and the finance chairs of uh, both communities. And uh, it's a request and we're responding basically to a request to look at this, their issue. 
by both selectmen is that they felt that there's going to be a, a um, this uh, hardship for many of their members, uh, residents, to achieve uh, or to pay their taxes, and there may be a delay in uh, their ability to pay the taxes um, this summer, and that may have an impact on their ability, you know, in terms of uh, their mill rate and a variety of things, and have asked us to consider that, and that's how I projected it last week that we've been asked to look at it and their recommendation that they felt was uh, appropriate was to have, you know, no change in the budget from last year. And um, so that's, and that's what they're looking at in their town budget. So in response to the communica communications from the selectmen, um, I suggested that we go ahead and look and see if we can do that. We have not agreed to it. Uh, this is what this process is about to see if there's uh, consensus on the board to move ahead uh, with these numbers. But uh, until we have an idea what that looks like, uh, we're not making a decision until hopefully uh, April 22nd or 20, 29th. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to look at what are the impacts of this whole COVID virus on our budget and on the community's budget and how, do, how does the Board of Ed respond to that? Um, so that's, that's where we are. I think that we are having that discussion. Um, yes, is the staff looking at that? Yes. Um, and I think that's an appropriate action for the uh, staff to do and have us take a look at it when it comes uh, time for us to vote. In the meantime, if we decide that these issues are such high priority for us for next year that there, there's no way that we should propose a budget cut. But we will have surpluses uh, that can be applied to next year's budget. We, we have an uh, opportunity to, you know, to use some of that money to offset next year's costs and reduce our budget. So I think there's a variety of things that we need to do. Uh, and I think that's what's, what I recommended that we go ahead and, and pursue those things over the next a few weeks and come up with, uh, you know, what we see is a rational budget at the end. But there's no, nobody has said for sure that we're going to get to zero. We're, you know, that's what we're trying. It's, that's a possibility. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I guess it's just about the, it's just the process. I just wish it, the language that it come out was, I mean, we've been asked, like, this is, this is the discussion we had in this meeting. We would like, you know, I wish in the, the last board meeting we would have had a discussion and say, do you all, you know, let's have a discussion. Do we, do we want to dedicate the resources of our staff and, you know, our budgetary, like budgetary staff to go back and look through the budget again and start making these change, like start looking at, recon, you know, reconfiguring the budget and making those changes. Do we all agree that that's an appropriate, like move towards that way? Um, I just don't think that that, it, it wasn't really presented as that this was a board level decision. It was more of like, this is what the ask is, this is where we were, we're going to go. And I just felt like the, the, the board as a whole was left kind of a little bit out of that loop. And again, it's just a process. It's not that I don't agree with recognizing the situation and trying to make cuts and trying to, you know, but I think, it just was a little unsettling from the standpoint of the, the process, process. It felt like things were getting done outside of the normal kind of board meeting process. I think we just have to be careful about even when we meet with town leaders about what is said and done and communicated um, without the full board being present during those meetings. Well, the full board is not going to be, you know, we have a finance committee that doesn't include the full board. We have meetings with the selectmen every uh, few weeks uh, that doesn't include the board. And, and, and in this crazy time, you know, these are issues that were brought up uh, in response to how are, how are we all going to act uh, with regard to the uh, virus. So. Uh, just remind me of that that meeting, and I and I think um, first of all, Andrew, I think that's um, 
I think it's appropriate. I mean, it was brought up last meeting. I think it's appropriate to talk about it. That's, you know, I think that's part of what this budget, uh, this item is on the agenda. I think that needs to be discussed. But I think, Bob, um, the commitment was we'll take a look at it. You know, I don't, I didn't feel like we left that meeting. It said we're coming in at zero. And uh, if, if, um, you know, I certainly, there hasn't been a budget season, even in a great time where the board hasn't said, disagree, I disagree with that item. I want you to, we want you to take it out. We don't support it. Or um, we'd like to see the budget reduced. I mean, I, we were reducing budgets that were coming in at a negative number. So I think that, you know, I would love it if we had a surplus this year and whatever it was, even if it wasn't zero, that it, I have always wanted to be able to leave the proposed budget intact and not have to touch it at all. And we may have a look at our budget on Friday and say, you know, we stand behind every single proposal or, you know, we were able to do some professional development during the school closure and we can reduce professional development by $40,000 because we, we were able to do that uh, during the 1920 school year, or there were a few things that we were able to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, here's, here's what we came, the, here's what we came up with again, not with the, we're trying to hit zero because I have no idea really what the surplus is going to be. And from two days ago with this thought that, you know, perhaps we were going to realize a $400,000 savings in transportation to, you know, Kim and I had the conversation today and I said, I think our best strategy is is to not is is to not build bake into any formula for this year transportation the savings from our transportation contract like let's just let's just leave that alone um, and I I appreciate that and I do think the I think this warrants a discussion um, and I, I guess I anticipated that that's part of what would happen this evening too. Yes. I, I, um, Andrew, I, I heard what you said and I fully understand and appreciate it. Um, my understanding at the last meeting wasn't that there was a mandate to go to zero or that it was agreed to go to zero. It was that the, the administration and the board would take a look at what they could do to try to approach um, a zero or reductions, because I don't even think anyone committed to getting to zero, um, but they said it was likely we could given the transportation, but now that has changed. And that's why I think we should wait until it's more fluid. Uh, I mean, the situation is fluid, and that's why waiting and collecting the, the numbers over the next several weeks is probably the most prudent course. Um, that said, the other part that makes this a very different budget year is that the full onus of the adoption of the budget lies with the Board of Education. The Board of Education is not sending it to a referendum for a vote, and then we could be reconsidered if the, if the populace overturned it. We are going to make the final adoption, and I think it's imperative that we take community input in all of its forms, which is why we're trying to put that form out so that we can, can collect community import, input. But that's a very important piece of information that did come from the town leadership, the Board of Selectmen and the Board of um, Selectmen, uh, I mean, Selectmen and Finance of the towns, their, their leaders, respective leaders, because this is a year where those boards are also adopting the budgets without a vote. And that's a lot of trust that the public has put in all of us uh, or that they now have to put in us to make sure we do the right thing. So 
having said all of that, the, the last thing to understand is that, and why I think one of the most important points that was mentioned lightly was that we may not have the ability to collect the taxes in the towns at the rates that we collected them before. Middlefield's budget's at well over 99% tax collection rate. When you look at towns like, like the, the big cities, Hartford and New Haven, their tax collection rates are down at the 50%, 40% level. But our town, our towns, both towns, have extremely high collection rates. And with everybody with the level of unemployment that may result from this, the ability to collect those taxes may slip. And if it drops to 97%, which is still an outstanding collection rate, that's a mill <laughs> or two that we don't collect, that we won't have to pay our bills from the towns. So anyways, all I'm saying is, is, is none of these decisions should be made in a vacuum. Um, as for should we go back and take a look at it, I think the remainder of the budget process, we were going to be looking at the rest of the line items anyways and questioning them. So I don't see this as being terribly outside of what it is. It's just an, a, a very extraordinary time and maybe a, a more preemptive look at it than later in the budget season. So I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the way it went, um, and, I'm, and I'm very pleased to see the administration taking a proactive lead on Friday. And um, I would support a meeting on Monday. Um, there is a Board of Selectmen meeting that, that starts at 6.30, so um, I may join late, or um, I, I will join the Board of Education meeting late, um, or maybe on time, but just to let you know that I, I'm in favor of a Monday meeting um, if you want to go ahead and schedule it. Just to hear the results of Friday and have some dialogue on what was discussed there. Any other comments? Thank you. And thank you, Kim and, and Kath, and all of the information on the budget. The uh, adoption schedule, as we talked about earlier, was that uh, we would have another meeting on April 22nd, which we would try to adopt the budget at that point. If not, we could do it on the 29th. That would be our proposed budget that would then go out to public notice through the process that Bob has been talking about. So that, that would give us basically most of April to uh, figure out where we are in the budget, get all the information that's necessary, the changes that are occurring, any surpluses that might be available, and then uh, adopt the final budget um, for, uh, for public notice. Then we would, right now we would then have to June 1st, uh, probably to vote on our budget. And again, as Bob said earlier is that there is no referendum, there is no public hearing, there are, uh, this is a budget of the 10 of us. Um, so this is, puts a little bit more emphasis on, you know, our ability to understand and approve the budget and know its impacts on the community. And uh, we're accountable for it fully this time. Any other comments on the schedule? No? Um, on communications, um, I did receive a, I think the board received a letter from Phil Auger indicating that he, he didn't think that, that we should we should make decisions as, until the last possible time and that the uh, he wasn't confident that the education the kids would get was equivalent to um, our regular education. I did receive a, a letter from Danya before, Danya Viola before the meeting asking us not basically to lay off any non-essential workers, which uh, we're all basically anybody but a teacher. Uh, that will go into the record as a comment. I also got a comment from uh, Chuck Stengel right before the meeting asking us to talk about the process for a referendum, which I think we have done. Uh, any other communication? And I've received communications from obviously the 
um, chairs of the, we're on the listserv from the chairs of the boards of education uh, and re related a whole series of issues. Uh, we got information from Cave on the governor's um, executive order. The new one uh, I'll send out that uh, the summary I got today, I'll send that out uh, as well. Uh, it talks about the transportation issue and, and issues like that that we are talking about tonight. And um, that's uh, about it. Any other communications? Yeah, we've been talking to the governor all week. All set, Bob, thank you. Anybody else? I did have lots of feedback on uh, distance learning. Um, the kids seem to be uh, getting accustomed to it and are uh, hopefully that uh, they're learning a great deal. If not, again, for public comment, um, you email me at armor at RSD13. Uh, I think that there's about 20 of you online. Um, <clears throat> and we will uh, put all your comments uh, in the minutes of the uh, meeting and we will probably uh, identify them at our next meeting. We didn't get the agenda or the minutes typed yet from last week and we certainly won't have it done for the 6th. So, but on the 22nd, we should have minutes from the last two meetings. Is that correct, Kath? I'm sorry, Bob, I was just trying to see. Oh, we don't have minutes yet, but we probably should have them on the 22nd for the last two meetings. You know what, I, um, I just got the minutes and um, it, it just takes me probably a couple hours to go through them to check them for accuracy. So um, that's okay. They'll be up soon. Uh, you'll have you'll have them before um, the meeting on Monday the sixth, right. and they'll be on the agenda for approval on the sixth. Um, if you know what would be helpful for me though, um, you know, we'll put some standing items just in case there are updates for you uh, related to the virus or the the impact of those decisions on the school, but. I think if it's okay for you with you that that will will be the item is just budget discussion um, yeah, for Monday. Good. Yeah. I'm I sorry. Think, I think that was the purpose of the meeting. Okay. Any other comments or communications? Thank you all and stay uh, careful and safe. Glad to see you're all here and nobody's sick that's great so. move we adjourn victor frederick we had a motion from victor to adjourn do we have a second second all in favor aye 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 good night good night good night everybody thank you thank you, thank you. good night victor <laughs> good night john boy <laughs>